Hey, what's up, guys? And welcome to Listen Up. Uh, we want to say just a big, big thank you for all the support you've shown us throughout the past few episodes of Listen Up. And uh, we've gotten so much good feedback. And today, we're very, very pleased to come up with another topic. It's a very interesting topic. And uh, we're very, very pleased, honoured and privileged to have not one, but for the first time, two special guests joining us. <laughs> Now, uh, this couple, and uh, I've only recently got to know the husband recently, lah, huh? but the wife I've known for quite some time. I believe all of you are quite familiar with who the wife is as well. But I'm going to do the honours of uh, letting them introduce themselves, or rather letting them introduce each other, because we want to inject some fun into the show. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time, please welcome the show on Listen Up, YB Hannah Yo and her husband, Ram. Clap, 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 clap. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, Brendan. Hi, Brendan. Thank you for having us. You are so welcome. And of course, on, on behalf of the whole entire LGR team, you know, we want to say a big, big, massive thank you to the both of you for availing yourself and your time uh, to speak to us today on Listen Up. Now, uh, before I introduce you, um, I'm not going to do that. I want I want you both to introduce yourself, all right? So let's start with let's start with the man first. Lah, huh? You know, let's start with the man introducing the wife and then the wife introduce the husband. Please, go ahead, Ram. Sure, sure. Let me try. Um... She's, uh, you know, Malays- she was Malaysia's first woman speaker. Well, this one, my CV, all he know prepared already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She was Malaysia's first woman speaker mm-hmm. and, and uh, 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 um, she's the current member of parliament for Sagambun, mm-hmm. um, former deputy minister for women, family and community development. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's, uh, uh, she's a wife, she's a mother of two beautiful daughters. Uh, and they say that behind every successful woman, um, there is a very proud husband. Uh, Amen. And so, and so, hence, that's my introduction for why behind a yoke. Wow, <laughs> so sweet. Wow. Okay. Ah, uh, he's he's th- he set the bar quite high. Uh, by the way, uh, just to let you know, why behind uh, your husband has set the bar a bit high. So now your turn. Your turn. This is my husband Ram. We are of the same age. Uh, he is also forty-two, and uh, he's from Klang. He is a wonderful teacher of the Word of God uh, and also now uh, a businessman. And uh, I think in the last 13 years I've been in politics, he's been a great pillar of support uh, for me and also a counsel for me. Whatever I need um, advice on or direction, this is the man I've uh, been speaking to uh, and, and advising me uh, from... Uh, from the back or from the side or, or from the front. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, wow, very this sweet. Is very sweet. Rum. <laughs> wow, wow. I think that deserves an applause. Like. I think everyone's listening to watching this right now. You better applause for that. Right? I hope my oh, wife, uh, when I interview Phoebe, I hope my wife will introduce me like that or so. Uh, <laughs> very, very sweet words. But yes, uh, the both of you, thank you so much for joining us again. What an honor and a privilege. You know, we got YB Hannah you and of course her husband Ram. And uh, today's topic is, a, is, I would say, a very special one. And uh, it's what we would say, uh, the topic uh, is sowing into the future generations. Now, a lot of people identify the both of you, one as a politician and for Ram, you know, an entrepreneur, a Christian, both of you, you know, a man of God, among many other identities that the both of you carry. But I feel one of the more overlooked identities that both of you share is as parents. Um, and both of you are mommy and daddy. So... The, the reason I say this is because, uh, like I said, our topic is sowing to the future generation. And the thing about sowing into the next generation is a lot of it starts at home. Not even at church. Church is, I would say, a supporting role. But a lot of it actually starts within the household, at home, with the family. So we're going to delve into this aspect of sowing to the next generation through the lenses and the perspective of parents in which I have roped the both of you in. So, that is what we're doing today. So, before we start, maybe we can uh, ask you to share a little bit about what both your childhoods were like. Uh, you know, you've given away your age, but I'm sure there are many things about your childhood you can still remember, still very fresh. So, what was Hannah Yo like? You know, what was Ram like as a daughter and a son, uh, you know, last time? You know, maybe you can share with us even one naughty thing that you guys, that you did uh, that made your parents upset. Yeah. Okay, maybe I'll start first. Mm -hmm. I'm the eldest uh, of four siblings uh, and my father is a businessman. My mom is a housewife and uh, I was raised in a very moderate home. So we are not very, we are not rich, but we are just okay. That means we don't go hungry. Mm -hmm. Um, In in my years of uh, growing up with my parents, uh, I've always been given the freedom to decide on 
things or matters on my own. But one thing my father expected of me is to make, uh, you know, I always had to perform in class. Mm. I always have to be the top or number two, but actually number two is also not good enough for him. So that was the kind of expectation uh, he had. Uh, on me but apart from that he really literally just gave me a lot of freedom to you know if you want to explore tennis go and explore tennis you want swimming go and explore swimming whatever that um, that makes you happy you go and try it out but one thing that he forced me to do was he, he forced me to learn martial arts at the time uh, because he wanted to make sure that I was able to protect myself uh, so so that, that those are the two things I think that he made made it compulsory for me mm. to make sure I excel in studies and also t to learn how to protect myself. But one naughty thing I did when I was young, and until today I remember it, because that was the only time he punished me for that. Uh, when I was seven years old, standard one, um, because we're not rich, right? I had a very rich classmate. Uh, I still remember her name is Helen. Mm. Uh, and he, she, she will give us a lot of her coins. Those days, you know, in cantina, 50 cents, a lot of money. You can buy curry pop, you can buy curry me and all that. Yeah. So every day she would come with her coins and she would have leftover. So she would give it to me and my sister. I have a sister my age. Mm. So I was born in January. My sister was born in December the same year. So we grew up in the same class. Um, and, and so Helen started giving my sister and I her coins. And after a while, it became a habit. It became a lifestyle for me, you know, that I had extra coins and I have extra pocket money. And so one day, her mother decided to come to school to find out where, is, you know, where did all her money go. And so happened, the, the person the mother complained to was my teacher, who happened to be my house neighbor, literally next door to my house. So she was, she was very close to my parents. So my teacher came back and told my parents. And I remember my, my father punished us that night on our knees and said that, you know, I, I will smack you for taking money that did not belong to you. Wow. And and so uh, I, I got a smack on my hand with a ruler. I still remember because that was the only time my father disciplined me mm. uh, all my life until today. I That's the, the one lesson I, I will never forget uh, for not touching money that does not belong to you. And because of that today, you know, I'm able, I think, even though I, have, I had access to 3.5 million allocation mm. and all that, but I would not touch it because, you know, that, that money doesn't belong to me. Wow. Wow, that I did not expect that. <laughs> you really rewind the clock all the way back to when you're seven years old. <laughs> what is an amazing story? That's what an amazing story. Uh, you know, and who knew at seven years old you even you know? Wow, you were probably like you know. Is, are you still friends with Helen or not? <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know where she is now, know. but you know, I am so glad I I had I learned that lesson when I was seven. Wow, yeah. at a very young age, and it stuck to you all these years. And you can yes. still remember and retell it. That's amazing. Ram, what about you? Before you share, can I just say, you look like a very goody two-shoes kind of man. <laughs> like, you would probably be one of those, you know, very studious, uh, follow yeah. the rules, probably even a prefect, you know, just throwing out some yeah. messes here. Right. Like a straight right. A student. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you look like that to me, but, you know, maybe you can, uh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm wrong. No, you are right. You are absolutely <laughs> right. Everything you said is the truth. Um, and and um, all that she said as well, uh, uh, it's a very common childhood for me as well. So both of us have had very common childhoods among each other. Uh, uh, everything that she went through, I went through when I was growing up. Exactly the same, like almost to the T. The only difference is that um, she grew up in Subang Jaya. I grew up uh, for most parts in Klang. Uh, and my father's Chinese, your dad and, is Indian. Yeah, that, that's the only difference really. Uh, uh, you so know, you took money from your classmate also lah. Yeah, no, so, so <laughs> that did not happen to me. Uh, but, but everything else, I was a middle, I mean, it, we were very much a pure, uh, sort of like a middle class mm -hmm. family. Um, uh, father was a businessman, mother homemaker. Uh, the elders in my family, so you see, very common thread here. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Um, uh, my father's expectation was me was, uh, you know, number two isn't good enough, so same thing. So it's uncanny. It's an uncanny resemblance of how similar our childhood have been. Oh. Uh, yeah, so so very same expectations as, as to how she needs to be number one. She's the high, the high scoring student and the expectation that uh, both of our fathers placed on us. Our mothers were, were kinder, much more gentler. They were not so really focused on the academic performance. Um, they were more chill, la, like more chill people. La. 
a little more chill. Um, yeah, so I definitely grew up with that. Uh, me being wanting to to take on and live out my father's um, dreams for me. Mm. Right. Um, so one of the things that um, um, he decided for me early on was that uh, uh, you should you shall be an engineer. Um, and, and not just any engineer, uh, he picked out the field of engineering as well for me, which is mm-hmm. aerospace engineering. Um, and so then, and so that became my ambition, mm-hmm. right? So my father's ambition became mine. And I was quite happy as a child, you know, doing that because I thought, wow, if I could be an aerospace engineer, very exciting, you know, working with uh, aircrafts and, and space technology and all of that. Um, and, and so really living out my father's dreams um, through my childhood. Wow. Um, and uh, then I've got I've got I've got two siblings. I've got a younger brother and a younger sister. Um, and and yeah, I was the head prefect in my school. Oh, um, see, I kn- this is Holy Spirit talking to me. Eddie. <laughs> you were really the are you seriously? You were the head prefect. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I was the head prefect in my school. And then about uh, the time of sixteen or so, uh, I started to you know basically turn the other way. Um, I became a rebel without a cause. That, <laughs> That, that whole year, and both of us went through the same thing, yeah? Um, horrible, uh, horrible. So we were straight A's all the way, like from standard the one, sixth. from oh, standard yeah. one onwards, I uh-huh. was like top of class in every year. In every school that I went to, we, you know, moved around a bit in uh, the first few years, but in every school I went to, I came on top of the class. Mm. Um, and then that led, that, that led all the way um, to 15, In uh, we had like the PMR exam back then, straight A's as well. And then 16, I decided to just do my own thing. Uh, <laughs> and basically rebelled, uh, scraped through uh, with a great one in SPM. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, yeah, so so father got a bit of a disappointment there at the end of my schooling years. Uh, but then I think I made up for it after that in terms of uh, me really finding my own way and charting my own path. And then eventually getting into business. Um, so me and my father also both kind of entered into business in like a mid-life stage, like mm. in our 30s, uh, we entered into that, so we were not young entrepreneurs, um, and uh, so yeah, so that's 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 really my childhood. One one naughty thing or one uh, sort of a negative thing that I could think of that really stands out for me uh, was very early on, when I think when I was in standard one, the first year of primary school, mm-hmm. uh, the concept of being, you know, that whole sort of, you've got to do things well and being a perfectionist, which my father instilled in me, you know, you've got to really do things well, otherwise don't do it. Mm. Um, I took it uh, to another extreme. Um, and so in standard one, um, back then we have got school exams and tests and all of that. So I think it was one of the very first tests that I did. Right? And uh, part of the test in the class was to be able to do some drawing or coloring or some, you know, something of that sort. And I'm not so much of an artist, but I wanted to be good at it. I wanted the drawing to be really good. Mm. And so um, came time to hand up the work. I was not satisfied with my work and I decided to take it back home. Right. Uh, And I thought, look, I'll go and perfect this home and then I'll bring it back to class the next day. Mm -hmm. The whole concept of submitting on time was secondary to me because I wanted to make sure that I produce an excellent body of work. Um, and, And when my father found out that night, that I took back the test paper uh, <laughs> and did not submit it. <laughs> uh, he, he, he did not punish me at home. Um, he went back with me to school the next morning and made me explain everything to the teacher. Um, and that was not a very positive experience, I can tell you that. Uh, so, so, uh, I, so, so that was an imprint of... of what I can you know remember of one really um, um, uh, strong episode where I remember uh, really messing up. Uh, that was it. Wow, I would say that's not a very very rebellious thing actually. Uh, your intentions were quite pure. <laughs> like you wanted to make sure that like you know you did it yeah. a- as well as you could, and based yeah. on that, that's why you took it home. Maybe you also didn't know the protocols of an exam like yes. maybe seven years old, right? So thinking like, hey, I can still Correct. bring it back and then bring it back the next day. Correct. Very interesting. Yeah. Now, did you both experience the rotan growing up? Uh, you know, Hannah, you shared a little bit, you know, that your dad smacked your hand and that's probably the only time ever, you know, that he's really properly disciplined you. Um, what about the, the, the moms, you know? Oh, because, man. Yeah, did you experience, did both of you experience the, the you know, the, the much feared rotan, Tang Tiu? You know, the yeah, rotan. you see, that, that, that's why I, we, actually we learn a lot about parenting from our parents. Uh, my father only smacked my hand once. Mm. 
and because he only did it once, I remember that very well. My mother was regular, okay? <laughs> Constantly, and she she wanted to be fair. So it doesn't matter if number one and number four are fighting. Uh-huh. One, two, three, four. All four will get killed. No kicked. way. So, so the two and three so, is very innocent, you know. Yeah, all Anna the time. No so reason. after a while, uh, we got very creative. We would throw her cane. She would buy those bamboo cane. We would throw the cane behind the washing machine. So she constantly had to buy new ones until we move house. Then she found all the canes behind the washing machine. <laughs> Uh, so that was my mom, but because she did it so regularly, uh. I did not remember any lesson that she taught or why I was scared. And because of that, we made it a point, you know, not to, not to, not to do that all the time with our kids to over discipline or you know to nag constantly because you know it, it would go in and it would go out because you, you you're doing it too regularly. Yeah. So yeah, what about what about you, Ram? Yeah, um, I think my parents from. For me, it was the other way around. Though uh, my mother hardly, hardly caned us. Mm-hmm. Uh, my father did on certain events, uh, not on a regular basis, obviously. Uh, when the you know situation warranted it, um, uh, the cane would come out, uh, but only for the boys, though, uh, but not for my sister. Um, and uh, yeah, so so yeah, the cane was was a feature in the household growing up, um, but not. But he doesn't use that as a primary way um, uh, to deal with us or to you know discipline us. Uh, but being cane is not out of the ordinary uh, uh, for the boys. Uh, my you know sister hardly like uh, I think just my dad being uh, you know protective of his daughter. Mm. Uh, he I I don't think he has caned her even once. Uh, oh, but wow. for the boys, yes. Wow. Can I tell you? Can I tell you, Brendan? I want to add on this, like. When I was deputy minister, mm. I had to meet a lot of ambassadors uh, and one particular uh, European ambassador spoke to, to me and said, I would want Malaysia to do away with caning. Entirely, uh, because, like, Yeah, because they realize that it's really a problem here. Like right. Asian parents especially believe in disciplining and punishing. Uh, our, our personal belief is... Uh, Discipline is required, but you do not use violence or force mm. on your children. So children have rights too. Yeah. yeah. So for me, I would just go as far as a smack on the hand. Mm-hmm. You know, it is really a serious uh, uh, misbehavior. That that would be the furthest I would go because I I do not think that you know inflicting pain on a child is right. Mm. I was about to ask you, the both of you, to go check behind your washing machine. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, just in case yeah, <laughs> you might find yeah. some hidden, you know, bamboo canes behind your washing machine. Uh, maybe they picked up on it. But it's good to know as well, you know, because uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's a very a- typical Asian, uh, let's just put it that way. Uh, you know, the reason I asked this question about the rotan also because I wasn't spared, you know. My mum and the, and the cane was like, you know, very good friends. They were besties, <laughs> you know, they were, <laughs> they were very... Very, very close. And my sister and I, we really kena, man, last time. Uh, to the point where really they were, like, you can see the marks on the calf, on my calf, on my thighs. Uh, is really okay. that kind. So, uh, I would say that, I guess, you know, for people like us, between the three of us, we grew up okay. Even if we kena, kena rotan before, things like that. We kind of grew up alright. Uh, but I can see where you're coming from. Because yeah. the, other end, the other end of the spectrum is true as well, you know. There are other, a lot of kids who never got the rotan, but they still turn out absolutely fine. And, uh, you know, unless, like you say, like, it's like a super serious offense, but that also you go to the extent of just smacking your hands so that they remember. And you do it at appropriate times. Like, I guess that's what you're trying to say as well. So, one, one thing about our childhood, right? The both of your childhood, you say, were quite similar to, you know, each other. Now, you both have two beautiful daughters, right? And uh, let's just say that times change very fast. Uh, our time and their time are, I would say, very different, completely different. So, how would you say, how different would you say your upbringing was as compared to your children's upbringing today? What do you think has changed from that time till now? Hmm. I think definitely it's, it's a you know, different world that they mm. live in. Um, and also, we, we you know, have consciously tried to be better parents than the parents that we have, Right. Um, it's not a discredit to our parents. It's just that we learn from them and, and we try to be better parents. Mm. 
Um, so it's definitely a different childhood uh, than the childhood that I had. Uh, but one key feature that I would say is just the times that they live in, right? We, we grew up at a time where there was no internet. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, we were that generation who were introduced to the internet uh, when we were much older, when we were 16 or 17. Um, and so growing up, we had a very real world childhood. That's how, I, you know, I would put it. There are no, uh, the, the only screens that we had to come um, to face with is our TV screen. And even then, you know, you've got certain days um, and times in a day where you've got your shows. It's not on demand, right? Uh, now you've got on-demand TV, which is which is every TV is on demand. You've got Netflix on every TV now. Uh, so we grew up in that kind of an environment. So hence, that that is the childhood world that we live in. The the world that our kids live in is 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 a hyper-connected world. Mm -hmm. uh, screens everywhere they turn. Uh, there's a TV screen. There is their, their iPad screens. There's their phone screens. There's, you know. Um, so and and uh, how they interact with their friends are different than how we interacted with our friends growing up. Um, for me, fun is outdoor cycling, mm. uh, playing games with my friend. Um, for them, um, it can be a part of that, but that's not the only way to have fun. Uh, play games online. They meet friends online. They are very connected to all of their friends on a daily basis. We didn't have that luxury. A phone call uh, was. Uh, was a luxury. Um, so, so hence, hence that that for me is how how markedly different uh, my kid's childhood is compared to mine. Would you say? Yeah. Would you say that the 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 childhood that uh, they are having today, would you say is more difficult compared to when we were growing up? Would you say it's more I difficult? Would, I I would say definitely our children's generation now. There's so much expected of them, you know, online learning um, and constant like tuition, enrichment classes. Uh, maybe because today's generation, a lot of parents are maybe in, in a better financial situation compared to back then. Uh, in 1970s, during when we were babies, our parents' time, the, the, the mark of that generation at the time was to make sure that you could provide for your family. And that would mean, you know, hard labor job. A lot of fathers were away and mother make, making sure that the house is kept clean, you know, for the kids. Uh, but during those days, uh, I, I do not think that a lot of parents or fathers would be able to be present all the time for their children because they had to earn. Uh, it was a very different generation in 1970s in Malaysia, in, in Malaysia during that time. Today's parents, a lot of them are probably, you know, they have savings. When they when they do well, they have bonus. They can take their kids on, on trips once a year. Uh, parents can afford to work from home. Uh, those days, different, different generations. So today we can be more present for our children. Uh, but it does not mean, I, and I don't want to judge any parents because I feel that every parent has a different challenge. Mm. So... Uh, as long as I think the child is raised um, and have sufficient, uh, no, not all their needs met, but basic needs are met, I would say that's a good parent, you know, mm. just being able to fulfill the basic needs of a child and also being present for the child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, you spoke about your parents, you know, and uh, now today, the both of you are parents yourselves. Um, how important are the role of parents to children? Uh, take it from two perspectives here. Number one is, of course, your own perspective, being parents. And number two, let's talk a little bit and go back to the Word of God a little bit here. Let's, let's, let's delve into the Bible's perspective on the role of parents uh, to your children. So, number one, how important it is. And if you can, expound on two perspectives. You know, your perspective and also you can intertwine it with the Bible's perspective. Yeah, definitely. I think there's no more an important figure to you know, growing kids, uh, then their parents, um, you know, they, they, I, I don't think you can you know replace the role of the you know parent in the in the life of a child. That's how important it is. Uh, the the framework of how to understand your world and how to uh, engage with people and and uh, a value system for a child comes from the parents. Uh, you know, that's no doubt about it. Um, while we while the you know, there you know can be some dependencies and other inputs on school and church and friendship and you know cousins and all of that, but that's secondary, absolutely secondary. 
the, the you know primary role uh, it's a central role um, um, for the you know development of a child is the parent we can't run away from it mm-hmm. uh, and and uh, and that is in line with uh, how the word of God and how God sees it as well right God would entrust a mother to have a child God God would gift a child to a set of parents um, and uh, with the expectation and 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 with the with the principle that uh, this set of parents are the one who would instill in the child uh, all that the child needs, uh, physically, spiritually, uh, and and the soul of the child gets to feed of that. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, who the child is is a is a you know product of of you know many inputs that come from the parent, uh, physically and spiritually as well. Uh, and so you know because of that we you know it's it's a it's a very heavy responsibility, yeah. really. Yeah. You think about yeah. it, right? The creation of life, but not just the physical creation of life, but uh, how that life actually grows and become a human being in their own right. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. We have got, we have got every. I mean, the the wheels of power is in the hands of the parents. The parents can literally make or break a child. That is, that is, that is what it is, right? And so, hence, the duty of a parent is huge. But at the same time, also, I think. Uh, with the with that burden of responsibility comes the fact that once you understand that you are entrusted with a child uh, by God, then you know that this is a you know it is not all of our own doing, right? Uh, God has gifted us with this. It's a gift that we carry. So uh, so so then you can handle that with some kind of of uh, consciousness that uh, well this is mine. But this is not hundred percent mine. You know this belongs to God. This life belongs to God. And hence and hence. Uh, in times where we fail and times when we come up short, uh, you run up to the one who gave you the child. <laughs> you run to the one who have you know gifted you the child, and and uh, that's a place of learning as well for us, right? That's a place of learning for parents. So, so while there's a heavy burden of responsibility, there is also a place that we can run to for help, which is God Himself. For us, I think the moment we became parents, we gave grace to our parents, uh, and we are more forgiving of what we went through as a child simply because we are doing parenting today with the help of God. But our parents, we didn't come from a Christian home. Our parents didn't have that kind of support from from God or from the Word of God. And therefore, when we became parents, we gave grace. We absolutely gave grace to our parents. The other thing I learned a lot about parenting is directly from God's unconditional love. Um, and we know that there's no mistake that is beyond redemption, beyond forgiveness mm-hmm. because of who yeah. God is. And we also learn um, that you cannot delegate the job of raising and caring and loving your child to another person. You can't p- push that to the grandparents or even to the nanny, the maid or the school teacher. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. you have to take responsibility that that act to care and to provide to love unconditionally must come from the parents themselves and we learn this from John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave you know he took responsibility responsibility for the nature of men at that time and he died on the cross for us so he didn't delegate it to another person to go and do it you know God did it himself uh, and he he provided a solution himself what fantastic answers uh, Ram and YB Hannah very very good answers and i at this point already, you know, I'm learning so much from you. I'm not a, I'm not a parent yet, uh, but, you know, just hearing what you guys are sharing, uh, honestly, I'm also, like, lapping up uh, food, food for my spirit and, you know, and for my future. Uh, it makes me feel like I want to get my wife right now to sit beside me to listen to this, but no, <laughs> when the episode comes out, I'll, I'll, I'll let her watch it. Now, uh, very, very important. Now, you, you, as parents, right, is there a right time to have kids? Um, when did you, you know, a little bit personal, but, you know, did you and Rum sort of sat down and discuss extensively, speak about this, you know, uh, 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 maybe even faster than pray, you know, to decide that, uh, okay, the time is now. Uh, we are capable, we are comfortable, and now is the time to be parents. Uh, what are some of the things that, you know, you wanted to make sure you had uh, or you did before committing to this responsibility? As Ram has shared, it is not easy. Uh, I mean, it's a massive responsibility when you think about it. So did, did you really take the time or, or did you plan, did you speak? You know, what, what are some of the things that you did to prepare yourself as well? Okay. So um, emotionally, 
uh, when we got married in 2008, it was also the same time I was launched into politics. And so that was too much for us to adjust, you know, being a public figure and coping with work that way. And so we had to make adjustments, especially Ram in his career. Uh, he started his own business. He quit his job so that, you know, he could have more time with us. And also we decided at the time that we wanted to spend at least two years um, just both of us getting to know each other because if you know our story we didn't have um, uh, courtship or anything it was through a prophecy and so we got married we really wanted a time to know each other better uh, and then in that two years uh, of knowing each other then the desire for a child started coming uh, to us and uh, at that time also we discovered when we were ready we tried for one year uh, and we discovered that we could not conceive. And so we did the practical thing, which is to go and see a gynae. And that's when we, we found out that I had fibroids uh, growing in my in, in, inside of me. And that deterred us from conceiving. And so we did the practical things. We went to see a gynae, got that removed. Uh, and that's when, after that, we, con uh, we conceived. Uh, I conceived. Yeah. And uh, we became parents then. Mm. What about the things that, uh, you know, like before you get married, there's something called premarital cause. You can uh, go for this premarital oh, yeah, too. Yeah. Right? You Is that, a test, right? Yeah. Did, did you, you know, go through something similar, you know, to prepare yourself for that? You know, like make sure, okay, finances are fine. Uh, we've got a yeah. house, you know, we, we're comfortable financially. We're very stable now. Uh, you know, yeah. did you go for a course or something like that? Is, is, was there such yeah. a thing? Yeah, we did. We attended a premarital course mm -hmm. uh, ran by this wonderful couple um, uh, from another church because at that point our church was fairly young yeah. and we did not have resident in-house you know, couples who could do that. Uh, in fact, through that course, we became premarital counsellors after that, right? Mm. Uh, for the sake of our church. Uh, so we were introduced to this couple in another church, wonderful couple, we loved them to bits. Um, and and uh, we, we joined along with another couple from our church. So there were two couples um, in that session. Um, and we went through the whole thing. Uh, we, we, we insisted that we had to go through a premarital course, mm. um, even though we did not have such a program in our church. But we saw the value of that um, based on the fact that, one, yeah, our courtship is out of the ordinary. Um, and therefore, we needed to ensure that we had an external input as well uh, into that process. We didn't want to just... Uh, drive blind, you know, you want to be able to be guided along that process. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we saw value in learning from others who have gone through it and, and have had a lot more experience in marriage. Um, and so we did that. Yeah. So we went through the whole thing. Uh, there's all this, you know, practical planning as well, financial planning and all of that. Uh, we definitely did that. And, uh, but we were quite, quite sure in terms of, yeah, we will definitely have kids. Not so so it's not a question of uh, if, it's a question of when, mm. right? Uh, so that wasn't an issue. Of course, there are some, there are, there are some who, who, who may have to go past the if. Uh, we didn't have to go do that because we were both quite clear. We definitely wanted kids. Mm. Uh, but what blindsided us was the fact that, like what she shared, uh, what happened when we got married after that, uh, as far as, as she being launched into politics, that, that we did not see coming. Um, and so we had to work with that. We had to be, uh, you know, realistic with the fact that, yes, we still... So so what did not change was the fact that uh, we still wanted to start a family, right? Um, and so just finding the right time for that. And we felt that after two years, yep, yeah, we could do that. Let's, and, and, but that also came with uh, some, you know, sacrifices on our part. Like she said, I had to readjust uh, what I did uh, in the corporate side, um, come and start my own business so that we have got the flexibility and and uh, and and I would be a present father uh, because she's going to be really drawn into all the stuff that she's doing. Um, and so we had to readjust that. So once we had that rhythm going, right, uh, by the third year of marriage, and that was when we conceived and, and we became parents. All right. We also did a blood test. Oh. Uh, 
after we got married because they have this kind of compatibility test to make sure that you know when you eventually conceive it's actually safe for the child so you can go and do this test in clinic and hospital so we did that to make sure that you know we're well prepared and you know we could detect any problem early uh, the other thing that we also did after we became parents uh, is to take up parenting courses i i really think that nobody is a uh, born parent you know like you're born with the wisdom to know how to become a good parent uh, after you know when the, the kids are toddlers that's when you know oh, actually there's so much that i don't know i don't know how to cope with temper i don't know how to discipline a child uh and and you have to rely on the wisdom of other people so we sign up for parenting course too mm-hmm. Wow, that's very interesting uh, because it ties into my next question because, you know, let's just fast forward now. The kids are here already, you know, and, uh, you know, I wanted to ask whether there were any sort of ground rules that both of you have set, you know, when building your family and, uh, you know, when you want to decide how to raise your children. And, you know, now I hear that, oh, you actually rely on the wisdom of other people because I think you raised quite a good point there that nobody is born with the knowledge of, Okay, I'm gonna. I, I know I'm gonna be a good parent. I have no 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 problem with that. So you actually even equip yourself. I would say like you went for parenting course. Was that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So were there any ground rules that you both set uh, on on uh, deciding how you want to raise your children? And uh, you know maybe you can share some of this experience with us as well. I think one of the things is like what we spoke about the use of the rod, right? Uh, the whole spoil the rod and I uh, know spare uh, the rod, spare the rod and spoil the child. Um, word and scripture, uh, being able to grapple with that and understand that. And, and that's one of the big topics that we wanted to address for ourselves when we signed up for that parenting course. Uh, we actually wanted to gain an understanding as to what exactly should we do with that, right? Um, and uh, so that's one thing where we both decided that if we are going to use um, the rod and what and what that is, right? The rod is not, it is not a literal translation that it must be a rod. The rod is that instrument um, uh, of, you know, discipline, that instrument of, you know, it's the, it's the rod and the staff of the shepherd, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so what that rod is for the shepherd is different from us, you know, today, right? Uh, but it's still the concept of a rod still applies. So it doesn't need to be a rotan per se. Uh, and so what is it that, what, so what is our chosen rod, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we spoke about that and, and, and so we both, we, we both were comfortable with the fact that, yes, we don't have a rotan at home. We've never had one. Um, and we didn't want to use a foreign object to discipline our you know, children. Um, if we are going to discipline it, then it could be as, you know, our, our own hands, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, clear boundaries. Uh, we would not slap their face, for example. Um, we, would, we, would, we would slap, uh, smack them on their, on their palm. Uh, and this was when they were much younger, mm-hmm. right? Um, so you've got to do it out of gentleness and not in the spur of the moment because in the spur of the moment that's where you know you are actually disciplining out of anger rather than disciplining out of the principle that I need to teach you something right there's actually two separate things here we often react uh, out of anger and that is where and you know that is what we see our parents we see the anger of our parents when they are trying to discipline us but that is actually so far away from God right God does not react to us in anger god does express his anger but he does not punish us out of his anger god corrects us uh, like a shepherd would use his rod and his staff to say look you have you know way you have gone wayward now here come back here there is there is a sense of uh, peace and calm when god does that so you know similarly as parents as well we both you know decided that we would not discipline our kids uh, in the heat of the moment right we will have conversations with them. So they may cry and we may raise our voice. So that's, so that's the first thing. We may raise our voice and be firm with them. Um, and the language that we use as well, that's quite clear for us. We didn't have to dispute that. Uh, you know, very, very clear language. Uh, uh, no, uh, you know, there's a clear line that we draw, right? Uh, you don't curse at your kids. You don't, you know, use those kinds of languages. Um, and and uh, we don't call them names. None of that, right? And that's very clear for us. And so that's that's a... That's a red line that we never cross. Uh, and so those are the things that we have put in place as ground rules. And, and uh, you know, really that has, that has stood the test of time so far. Uh, my uh, first born is uh, 10 years old. Um, we have, you know, that, those same ground rules are in place. Uh, but I can also share with you that it's not been perfect sailing for us, right? Uh, you know, the other ground rule that we thought that 
is a good ground rule to have is that we would we would never fight uh, in front of the kids. Uh, but I can tell you, we broke that rule already many times. <laughs> when we say right? fight, it means quarrel, la. Like quarrel or argue, yeah. right? Right. Uh, we understand that that it's not good for kids to watch their parents fight, but we have at the failed. same time, you know, we have failed. But at the same time, we are also very conscious of the fact that yeah, when we fail, oh, we are failing, <laughs> right? And so then, then, then we would try to you know mitigate that. Uh, so why I'm sharing that is that you know ground rules are important, but uh, you know as parents we are also broken people. Uh, we are going to break those same ground rules that we set for ourselves. Um, but the more the the thing for us to learn is that to restore back or the restore back the ground rules because the ground rules are there for a reason. Uh, the principles are there not so much for us but for our kids, right? Uh, so so we we try to restore it back, um, and then we. Keep trying. We keep trying again. Wow. Where? Wow. Words of wisdom there. You know, that's that's fantastic. Now, you spoke about you. You know, sometimes breaking the ground rules, and that of course happens because we are still human. You know, and and we're not perfect as well. Even as parents as well. Uh, yeah, our kids can see us as superheroes, but even we also fail, and sometimes we don't meet the mark. Um, what about when a family sort of crisis happens? Uh, you know, I know this uh, as a fact that a lot of parents they tend to shield their children from knowing uh, or from, you know, shield them from crisis where basically when something terrible happens to the family uh, and they sort of try to appease and make sure, you know, give the kids peace. Nothing's wrong. Don't worry about it. And what about the both of you? Where, 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 do, you, where do you guys stand on this? Like, if just say a family crisis happens, do you include the children to say that, okay, this is what's happening so that they're aware of, you know, what's going on in the family? Or do you also agree that, okay, generally we can shield shield them, don't, they don't have to know. I think whatever we want to expose our kids to must be appropriate for their age. Mm. So you don't, you don't expose them to a crisis that even adults cannot deal with, right? But we do talk to them about, you know, sometimes we have problems with relatives or siblings, uh, things like that, they are aware, okay? Why is the auntie behaving like that? Or why is the uncle talking like that, you know? So, so they are aware because we reason that out a lot with them and we explain. The, the, the key thing, I think, is to demonstrate um, the lessons that you are going through, through parenting. So, for example, if I tell them that you shouldn't do this, mm. but I end up doing that, I must be able to bring myself to say sorry. Uh, so, what, what I've learned is the prayer time together is very important. Sometimes we pray together. Sometimes I pray to God in front of them both of them b before their bedtime and so when you confess your sin when you repent before god they learn also okay if i feel like that this is how you say sorry to god this is how you say sorry to each other so it's quite common for me to say sorry to my daughters uh, i want them to learn that saying sorry is not extraordinary it should be part of our lifestyle you know, on a daily basis, if we say, do, do, do the wrong things, say the wrong things, we must be able to say sorry, mm. regardless of right. our age or our maturity. Yeah. Wow. Very, very good. And, you know, a lot of parents, I feel like they could take a leaf out of this, you know, because it's so weird sometimes to hear your parents saying sorry to the children. And mm. in, a, in a very traditional Asian family, I would say the concept of your parents who, you know, uh, some you know, very China man or, or something like that, for them to say, son, I'm sorry. Wow, that's, uh, you know, it's very, it's very rare. It's actually very, yeah. very rare. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure a lot of parents who are also young parents who are listening to this, you know, this is something I think that is very much more important. Uh, both of you are Christian parents. So, you know, you mentioned earlier a little bit just now as, as well, Hannah, that praying together um, as a family unit, is it very important to, to have that time, that family time where you come together to pray together and in some ways, is that the window of opportunity to instill, you know, uh, Christian values or Christian lessons in their lives? Mm, definitely. We pray together before eating. Uh, that, that's usually very short prayer. Mm -hmm. We say yeah. praise. Uh, and, and at night, bedtime is our prayer time together. Um, we we make sure that you know we make that part of their lifestyle. So today our girls, if they don't pray, they cannot sleep because right. they feel like I need to talk to God. I need to I need to tell God how I feel, wow. what has happened today. So they they learn that 
as part of lifestyle and that's something we 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 make sure you know that's a life skill that we must teach our kids the kids must know how to pray and talk to god mm -hmm. they they don't have to be the most intelligent child they don't have to be the most successful child they don't have to be super rich in future but we know that if there's one skill we need to pass on and that is to teach them how to communicate and to communion with god wow. if they know how to turn to god they will be successful in life whenever they fall whenever they fail if they know how to deal with that failure how to confess their sin how to run back to god we have done our job wow beautiful beautiful ram anything to add to that or not yeah absolutely i uh the you know uh, approach that we have taken is that is is uh to not turn it into a ritual for them and so we have consciously not turned it into like a ceremony. Mm. And sometimes that is where, uh, while we have got good intentions as parents, we, we, we want, we see the value of prayer and forgiveness and, and, you know, but in our zeal, in order to teach our kids that, sometimes uh, the kids receive it in a different way. Mm. The kids look at it as a religious ritual in this family, right? That we need to do this, to, and then this, and then this, and then we need to repeat this every day. Yeah. Um, and so, while while we have instilled that habit, that lifestyle in in our kids, we you know do it in a, or we try to do it in a very natural way that that it doesn't seem out of the ordinary for them. If, for example, if they go out and they are in a meal with their friends and they don't get to pray, yeah, it's okay, yeah. right? Uh, so, I think that is something which we have got the benefit of coming, you know, you know, growing up in a non-Christian environment, that we understand the value of uh, not being religious, right? Mm. Uh, not being religious actually helps your kids learn a lot more uh, because they they help to understand why rather than just the what, mm. right? What is it that I must do? No, actually what you can, they, they are, you know, our kids are really good at what, you know, because there's, there's a lot of material and content there to learn stuff. Uh, but the why, is what they need their parents for, right? Why is it that we need to pray? Why is it that those friends are not praying? Why is it that it's not cool to speak about that, about somebody else's faith, mm. right? So we have those conversations, we're very real conversations with our kids now, um, and, and uh, to teach them the why behind those things. Because once they understand the why, then, then they'll be able to figure out all other, you know, secondary questions from there, you know? Uh, and so that is what we have consciously did. So, so while yes, there's you no know, prayer time and all, but it's not such structured, methodical. You must do otherwise bad things will happen to you, or you must do otherwise. You know, we we actually don't have that. Mm. Uh, but in so doing, so that is what I think the challenge of most parents feel like. Like we 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 will say this is very important, and therefore my kids need to learn this. But your kids are seeing it in a completely different way, mm. which you don't realize. Yeah. Right. This is oh, this this is now a formula, uh, procedure, a process that I need to go through. Uh, so we have been quite conscious with that, and not to make that like that for the kids. And in so doing, I'm glad to say that 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 approach has worked mm. so far. <laughs> that approach has worked. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Fantastic sharing. Now we're slowly running down out of time here. I mean, there's so many things to talk about, and uh, fantastic sharing so far. But just before we close, uh, real quickly. How do you think children spell love? I think you may have actually answered it uh, unknowingly just now. But in your opinion, how do you think children spell the word love? For my kids, mm -hmm. um, I think they would you know, spell it as F-U-N. Fun. fun. Yeah. I find that, that they really connect with us when we're having fun, when it's a fun activity. You know, uh, they, they really uh, you know, receive a lot from that. Uh, this is the age that they're in where they like to do fun stuff nice. and they may spell it differently as they grow up and they will they will spell love differently as they grow up but at this stage where they are 10 and 8 fun <laughs> yeah I think my for me and my uh, uh, my my time with the girls uh, I want them to I, I think they know right that l love is unconditional love that means no matter how I behave she will love me the same. Uh, it's not going to change how I react to them because I, b because both of us came from the background where you know we constantly had to be getting number one. Then we associate that's how my father will love me, mm. and so we don't want it to be performance based. So you know even if you don't do well, I, I 
so we make sure that we reiterate that many, many times to them that even if you don't do well, we will still love you. So it's not performance related. All right. So before we let you go now, uh, thank you so much for sharing you know, again, by the way. But before we let the both of you go, uh, what would you like to say to parents who are listening to this? Of course, we'll do it two prong. Uh, we'll ask you about the kids later as well. But let's start with the parents, you know, as parents from one parent to another parent. What is one thing that you'd like to say to all the parents who are listening out there? I think the one thing that I would say is that don't be too hard on yourself. Um, you know, parents have got the right to fail in front of their kids. It's okay. Um, I think for, you know, many young parents today, uh, they feel a need to perform as parents, especially Christian parents. Mm. They feel a need to perform even in front of their kids. Um, I, I think you've got to lift that burden of you. You've got to break that. You've got to break that expectation because that's, that's an unholy expectation uh, that, that you can't fail as a parent. As parents, from day one, you'll fail. Uh, so if, if, if you're not too hard on yourself, at least you get a chance, you give yourself a chance to grow and be a better parent uh, every day, right? Uh, and grow with your kids. So that's, so that's the one thing that I like to yeah. share. The, the, the Bible talks a lot about father, father, mother, right? But the mm. most common is honour your father and your mother. Uh, that's for us to do, for our parents. But there's also one mandate, I feel, that is given to us from God as parents. And that is to tell of His wonders, tell of His deeds to the next generation. King David spoke a lot about that. And that's why I think parents must be real about our challenges and our weaknesses to our kids. Because in so doing, you testify of God's greatness in your life, His forgiveness, you know, His grace. Uh, and so you, can, you need to continue to testify of that. And that's why I think testifying to the next generation, telling them about what God has done in your life is so important. And that ex, uh, requires vulnerability on, on your part, you know, to be real about your challenges and your struggles to your kids. But if you don't do that, if you're not real about your challenges and your struggles, they will not be able to relate to your God. Mm. Because to them, this God will only love perfect people. My parents are perfect. I don't hear of their struggle. And therefore, this God will not love people who fail. And so you teach and impart a wrong and false image of God to, to your kids. That's why I, I think telling of his wonders and his deeds to the next generation requires you to also share about your weakness, but at the same time about what God has done through you. Yeah, so that must happen hand in hand for your kids to learn about the wonders of God. Wow, fantastic sharing. Uh, you know, like I said, two-pronged answer when we talk about sowing to the next generation and we talk about sowing into our children as parents. What would you like to say to children who are listening? You know, you both are actually also children. Uh, children of God and your parents. So what would you say to children who are listening to, uh, to this right now? Well, I think for, for uh, you know, children who have got parents with you is to, you know, really treasure the moment uh, with your parents. Um, I have lost both of my parents very suddenly. Um, and with the birth of my kids, at about the same time, I've lost my parents. So I've gained and lost at the same time. Um, and so I would say to all kids, and it's us as well, also grown-up adults who are, you know, children, uh, to really treasure the time with your parents and to make every day count. Um, because really, I think uh, uh, as you grow older and as, as you, you know, your, your view of your parents are going to change and it needs to change for the better. Uh, but that's a, that's a duty of not just the parent, the child as well. The child has a role to play. Um, and uh, so, so that's what I would speak to uh, you know, children that is listening here. Yeah. For children who are parents, I think my message to you is to not deprive your parents of their time with their grandchildren. I think it's uh, so important that uh, they have access to their grandchildren and as much as you can allow them to spend that time. Because like what Ram says, uh, you know, sometimes life can end very unexpectedly uh, on anybody. And so you want to make sure that the grandchildren experience having their grandparents around. Uh, and no, like I say, no, no grandparents are perfect also. We know about our parents' weaknesses. But you want to be able to not deprive your kids of access to their grandparents. Yeah. Mm. So you've got to make that happen. Wow, fantastic. 
Thank you so much, Ram and YB Hannah Yo. Truly an honor and a privilege to have you share on the show on Listen Up. And I've personally I've learned a lot from the both of you as well. And I really look up to the both of you, you know. And really, uh, truly, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for coming to share and uh, sharing your insight, especially on both your relationship, your dynamics as husband and wife, and as mommy and daddy, and how what your take is in sowing to the next generation from uh, from home. From, the, from your household so I'm super encouraged by what you have shared and to those of you who are listening to this episode right now you know we hope that you will also learn a thing or two now uh, as we close don't forget guys of course the standard things that I want to tell you of course uh, Discord community is something that uh, we are on so you can join our Discord uh, community the links are in the description below don't forget as well to subscribe to our brand new YouTube channel uh, you can listen to all episodes so let's get real and listen up there you can stream us on Spotify Apple Podcasts Google Podcasts as well so uh, YB Hannah, Ram, again, I want to say thank you so much. Uh, God bless you. And I cannot wait to hopefully meet you uh, together uh, physically when this is, you know, when things are better. Thank you so much. God bless. And thank you to all of you who are listening. We'll see you guys again next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, Brendan. Thank Bye. You, Brendan. Bye-bye.